Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, which team has fared best so far in 2021? Who's won the most and who has yet to win anything at all? We've also got thrills and spills at the Tour de Romandie. Meanwhile, at the Festival LC Jacobs, no wins all season, and then three come at once for Emma Norsgaard. Plus, the eight-day Tour de Rwanda has begun, and I'll be explaining everything you need to know about the brand new UCI Track Champions League. Before we get on with what's happened last week, though, we'll start with what is to come. This Saturday, it's the start of the Giro d'Italia. 21 stages, 3,480 kilometers, 40 k's of gravel roads, the usual splattering of epic mountains, including the mighty Monte Zoncalan, and a heap of top stars on the start line fighting for the Maglia Rosa. And this is your reminder that we have every single stage live and ad-free on GCN Plus. And it's going to be available in all GCN Plus territories, except for Latin America and New Zealand. And I've got some breaking news. The Giro d'Italia will be exclusively on GCN Plus in both the USA and Canada. And I honestly can't wait to have your company over the course of those three weeks. Now, along with the daily live coverage, much of which will be for the entire stage, we will also have live pre and post race shows with a whole host of special guests, long highlights, short highlights, and an on-demand coverage, all in seven languages, plus interactive polls and quizzes so you can get involved with your own opinions on the most controversial topics, written previews, race updates if you want them from the app, and much, much more. Favourites set to start include Egan Bernal, Simon Yates, Mikel Lander, Alexander Vlasov, Emmanuel Bookman, Hugh Carthy, Jai Hindley, Joao Almeida and his teammate Remco Evenepoel, who will make his Grand Tour debut and his return to competition after eight months away through injury. Another man making his return to competition will be Dylan Kroonewegen, whose nine-month ban comes to an end this week. He'll be facing the likes of Caleb Ewan, Elia Viviani, Tim Malia and Peter Sagan in the sprint finishes. You do not want to miss it, so if you haven't already taken out a subscription, now would be a very good time to buy one. I will have our big GCN preview with a look at all the key stages and riders taking part out over the next couple of days all being well, so make sure you check that out right here on GCN Racing's YouTube channel or ad free on GCN Plus. But before all of that, to get you in the mood, here's a quick montage. Absolutely incredible. What a day, what a win. We had some great battles. That's what sport is all about. I bloody love the Giro d'Italia. What a race. Right now, though, let's move on to the biggest race from last week, which was the next stop on the Men's World Tour, the Tour de Romandie. On Tuesday, we had the opening time trial, or prologue as it was deemed given the short distance, with a 1-2-3 for the Ineos Grenadiers. But remarkably, Filippo Ganna was not one of those three riders, only managing ninth on the day. It was Rowan Dennis who took his second victory of the year, with Geraint Thomas and Richie Port in second and third respectively, nine seconds down on their teammates. Peter Sagan also took his second win of the year on the first road stage the following day, a result that bodes very well for his Giro d'Italia ambitions. It was only his second ever win at the Tour de Romandie, and it came exactly 11 years to the day after his first. That was in 2010, the year he burst onto the pro cycling scene. It was Sonny Colbrelli who was runner-up that day, but he got his own back the following stage, taking his first win of the year. And then it was the turn of Marc Soler on stage three the Movistar rider attacking over the last climb of the day and soloing to victory with enough of a margin to also go into the leader's yellow jersey. However, the overall classification was always going to hinge on the final two stages, with the first of those, the Queen stage, held in typical Tour de Romandie conditions, i.e. cold and very wet. In fact, so severe were the conditions on that day that the organisation decided to neutralise the descent which preceded the final climb to the finish. A nice idea in theory, but in practice, the breakaway wasn't slow much at all, and the bunch was. So by the end of it, they had an extra two minutes to claw back on the breakaway. And so for quite some time, it looked like Magnus Court would do the unthinkable and take both the stage win and the general classification. As always though, once the bunch and the main favourites started chasing in earnest, the gap plummeted, everyone was caught, and we had a mano a mano amongst the best climbers on the day. And the two best climbers on that day were Mike Woods 
and Geraint Thomas. The Canadian had attacked from some way out, Thomas catching him with a couple of Ks to go and time trialling his way to finish in search of the yellow jersey and the biggest margin possible over his rivals. Into the closing metres though, and it was obvious he wanted the stage win too. He clicked it down a gear, got out of the saddle to sprint and then... The rain is falling, it's sleet and snow at the top. Oh, and Thomas is down! Thomas is down! Woods across the line! Oh my word! Ouch. Thankfully, it was his pride that was hurt more than his body, and in his post-race interview, Geraint Thomas was characteristically pragmatic. I just had no feeling whatsoever in my hands. I tried to change gear, but instead I just lost the bars. And, uh, oh, it's so frustrating, because uh, even if I just stayed in that gear and just come second, you know, and, oh, but to deck it there, I feel like a right whopper, but yeah. A right whopper. I love that. Uh, Mike Woods took the stage win, but Thomas more than made up for that mistake the following day in the time trial. Not with the stage win, that went to the French champion Remy Cavagna, but in finishing third, Thomas had done more than enough to seal overall victory and his first win since the 2018 Tour de France. Which just goes to show you, you can't keep a good man down, even if he is down quite a lot. Uh, Ineos Grenadiers may not have won that final stage, but with four riders in the top 10 and Richie Port second on GC, I think they can go home reasonably happy. And so too can De Kernic Quickstep. Fausto Masnada put in the time trial of his life to end up on the final step of the podium in the GC, whilst Cavagna's win was the 21st of the season so far, putting them at the top of the world's team leaderboard as they have been every year since 2013. A remarkable record, really, especially considering they don't have the biggest budget. That, as we all know, belongs to the Ineos Grenadiers, who sit second so far in 2021, with 15 wins as of yesterday. De Koenig Quickstep's tally has come from 10 different riders, whilst Ineos has come from nine. Third on the list is Jumbo Visma with 14 wins, but only amongst four different riders. George Bennett won the New Zealand National Championship at the start of the year, whilst Vinegar and Van Aert have four wins each, and Primoz Roglic has five. Now, the fourth team currently on the list is UAE Team Emirates with nine, but it's Tadej Pogacar who's won six of those, and the only wins, in fact, outside of national championships. Ryan Gibbons won the South African road race, whilst Yusuf Mertzer won the time trial and the road race in the UAE. What that means is that the four best teams in the world have won more than the other 15 teams combined. Intermarché, Wanty Gobert, who you remember only got their World Tour licence late last year from CCC, are yet to get themselves off the mark, whilst DSM, Quebec Assos and AD2R have only one win each. Three teams sit on two, EF, Education, Nippo, Cofidis and Astana, whilst the rest, I guess, are sat mid-table. Interestingly, Alps and Phoenix, who are only a pro team, so pro cycling second division, have 10 wins, which would put them in fourth if they were World Tour. Uh, Van der Poel has taken four of those, with Philipson and Malia taking three each. So watch out for Malia at the upcoming Giro d'Italia. Meanwhile, on the women's side, it'll be no surprise to hear that SD Works are sitting at the top of the table with eight wins so far this year, which doesn't sound like a huge amount compared to the men's, until you consider the fact that they've had very little racing in comparison. Uh, those eight wins, incidentally, have come from seven different riders, with Van der Breggen the only one to have two to her name. And that is a 33.3% strike rate because she's only done six days of racing so far in 2021. Of everyone on SD Works, Christine Maharus is the one with the most race days so far this year, with 13. Uh, the men with the most race days at De Koenig Quickstep, meanwhile, are Mattia Catania and Remy Cavagna. Yesterday's Romandie time trial was their 29th race day of the year, and the only riders on that team who have fewer race days this year than Maharus are those that are either still injured or only return to competition after recovering from injury. Second on the list of women's world teams in terms of wins are Mobistar with five, so one more than their male counterparts, whilst three of the eight teams are yet to get themselves off the mark. FTG, Nouvelle Aquitaine Futuroscope, Canyon Stram and Ali BTC Ljubljana, but with still well over five months to go until the end of the season, there is plenty of time to change that. Three of Mobistar's women's five wins this year actually came in the last two days at the festival Elsie Jacobs. The race started on Friday with a short prologue won by the sprinter Lorena Vibes of Team DSM, with her teammate Leah Kirschman in second place. However, this big crash for Vibers on day two, her second major crash of this season, left her short when it came to defending that lead. And despite a third place for DSM with Kirschman, they lost the leader's jersey to Emma Norsgaard, who finally took that elusive victory that she's been so close to all season. 
She beat Confalonieri to the line, and such was the speed of those two riders, there was actually a two second gap given to Kirschman in third. And Norsgaard clearly took a lot of confidence from that going into the second and final road stage, in which she not only defended her race lead, but took her second victory in the space of two days. Her third, in fact, as she also won the general classification, plus the points and the youth classifications to boot. Not bad. Congratulations, Emma. That was thoroughly well deserved. Right, we're going to move on now to the Tour de Rwanda, a race that many of us have read about and seen photos of, but rarely or never any actual footage. That's changed this year with the organisation filming the event and cutting highlights which we can then show on GCN+. It's a great first step, and it was a great first stage. 116 kilometres from Kigali to Roa Magana, with an early break of three animating the day, including Mohamed Nur Ayman Mozarif from Malaysia, who did enough to secure the early lead in the King of the Mountains competition. His teammate at the Terengganu cycling team, Carlos Quintero, went on the attack in the closing stages and was only caught inside the final 300 metres. A bunch sprint ensued with Brian Sanchez of Team Medellin taking the win and the first leader's jersey. Alex Hoon of Wildlife Generation Pro Cycling finished second with Sanchez's final lead out man, Roldan, managing to get third on the day. It just looks like a brilliant event, and I particularly love this clip from Pierre Roland on the days leading up to the start of the race. The country just seems to be so happy to have the event going on there, and I can only imagine what the atmosphere is going to be like if they're successful in their bid to host the UCI World Championships in the coming years. Next up, a heads up as to what is coming up on GCN Plus this week, and believe it or not, it's not all about the Giro d'Italia. I mean, it mainly is. But we will also continue, of course, with our daily highlights of the Tour de Rwanda, well worth 10 minutes of your time each day. Plus, the postponed Volta a Algarve starts on Wednesday. Seven World Tour teams taking part, with Bennett, Ackerman, Asgreen, Hayter, Kamner and Narsen amongst the big names on the start line. Uh, that race is going to be available live every day in all GCN Plus territories. Meanwhile, on Wednesday, we're going to have Pippa York back on the sofa for the world of cycling, looking back at the Tour de Romandie and forward to the Giro d'Italia. And there are, of course, two more films dropping this week too, one of which is the latest in the Legend series. This time we visited Chris Boardman, Olympic pursuit champion, former World Hour record holder and yellow jersey wearer at the Tour de France. So here is a sneak peek. This was my old stomping ground. Probably about an hour's ride to get to this terrain for me. World titles, Olympic medals, the hard graft that got him there was done on these hills. I was just the person who was there. There are moments when Great Britain did something and it never occurred to me that we'd still be talking about it a quarter of a century later. I must admit, I've not seen that one yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it, I must say. And another thing I'm very much looking forward to is the brand new UCI Track Champions League. It's going to start in November this year with six rounds over six consecutive weeks in various locations, with four outright winners crowned at the end of it all. The best male and female sprint riders and the best male and female endurance riders. Now, this new concept aim is to simplify track racing in order to attract a new and therefore bigger audience. At each event, there will be 32 male and female competitors, 16 each for the sprint events, and there will be a Kieran and sprint for them, and 16 on the endurance events, which will be the elimination and the scratch. The sprint is going to be run over heats, with three riders going head to head in each, and the first across the line after three laps, progressing onto the semi finals, and the three winners of those progressing onto the final. The Kerin will be six riders on the track at once, with a Derny for the first two laps before they're left to fight it out over the final three, with the first two riders from each heat going into the final. Meanwhile, in the endurance events, the elimination will see 18 riders take to the track at once, with the last to cross the line on every other lap eliminated until we have our winner. Uh, whilst the scratch race will be held over five kilometres, so just 20 laps of the track. Prize money, from what we understand, will be substantial and split equally between the men and the women, whilst qualification for the events will be based on performances at the UCI Track World Cups and indeed the Olympic Games. The official launch presentation of this new series will be on the first rest day of the Giro d'Italia and you'll be able to watch it live on GCN. Now, I know a lot of you already love your track racing and I know a lot of you will get into it this year through the Olympics, so put that date in your diaries. Moving on, we also had the Welter Asturias taking place over the weekend, and it was a return to winning ways for Naira Quintana. He soloed to victory on stage one, and nobody was able to take the lead away from him after that. Stages two and three went to Hector Caratera and Pierre Latour, respectively. 
And over in Australia, one of the longest one-day races of the year, Melbourne to Warrnambool, 20-year-old Jensen Plowright of Bridge Lane put in a late solo attack to become the youngest winner of that race since Will Walker back in 2004. Uh, it's quite unique, really, in that the women's competitors start with the men, and so the winner there is normally the person who survives latest into the race, which this year, for a second time, was Matilda Reynolds. She was amongst three women to come home in a group 17 minutes behind Plowright. Justine Barra and Nicole Frain finished second and third third respectively. In other news, Kasper Asgreen is the latest De Koenig Quickstep rider to extend his contract, in this case through to the end of 2024, meaning that they have retained three of their biggest stars on a very long-term contract. And finally, Tom Pidcock has now turned his attention back to cross-country mountain biking, and he got off to a flying start by taking a convincing win at the Swiss Bike Cup in Lurkerblad. Mona Mittelwauner took the women's race, and they will both line up for the first World Cup this weekend in Albstadt, Germany. Right, that is all for this week, but I can't wait to see you all on Saturday for the Giro d'Italia, and indeed earlier than that, for our big GCN Giro d'Italia preview. It's going to be a spectacular three weeks. I'll see you then.